Welcome to Sustainability Now, an exploration of technologies and paradigms to shape a world that works. Designed for socially conscious entrepreneurs and individuals interested in responsible stewardship of the planet. Sustainability Now covers food, energy, housing, water, waste, health, economics, and consciousness. Welcome to your community, Sustainability Now, with your host, Mira Rubin. Welcome, everybody, to Sustainability Now, Technologies and Paradigms to Shape a World that Works. I'm Mira Rubin, your host, and I am delighted to introduce Lynn Landis. Lynn is a Philadelphia-based writer, researcher, and activist in politics, health, and the environment since the 80s. Her articles and opinions have been published in several books, films, and online publications. And currently, Lynn is the publisher of several websites and has a variety of meetup groups, which is actually how we met, uh, totaling over 7,000 members. Her meetups focus on foraging, fiber arts, historic streets, and health. And you can find Lynn's main website at Lynn Landis, that's L-Y-N-N-L-A-N-D-E-S dot com. And what we're here to talk about today, especially, is Wild Foodies, Dot org and that's w i l d f o o d i e s dot org that's how we met lynn i am so delighted to have you here i'm so excited by what you're up to welcome well thank you for having me on your show this is exciting <laughs> it's exciting for us too so um i i when we talked we were discussing wild foods mm-hmm. and i think that this is an area that it goes into um, all kinds of areas, but just in terms of knowing that nature can nourish us directly. Um, right. And we've lost a lot of that knowledge and wisdom, and here you're a carrier of that information, and, it, and you're disseminating it and popularizing it. And, and I'm hoping that we can talk about some things that people can find in the wild that are nutritional and medicinal and um, by the way, everybody will have pictures on our website so that you don't have to just imagine these things. But where where is a good place to start with this, Lynn? Well, I think it's um, it's interesting to note that we've been taught in school that civilization and agriculture started at the same time. You know, that's how we all got organized into governments and and jobs and this and that. Uh, but in fact, uh, nature had provided. Uh, our food, medicine, and shelter for thousands and thousands, <laughs> a million. How old are we? Eons. I have no idea. Eons. And and so you know, and being somebody who hates to shop, I I just loathe shopping for the most part. Um, it just occurred to me, and and also being exposed to it um, on a radio show I had once a long time ago. Uh, that there was something out there called foraging and that a lot of those, uh, you know, what grows naturally is edible. So I just got curious and started looking it up like a lot of people have nowadays. And it's just unbelievable uh, the amount of food that's out there. And it's really, um, you know, kind of a colossal waste that Mm -hmm. we're not educating our children and ourselves about all of these resources that are right under our feet. Literally Especially right when there's so much food insecurity these days, too. Yeah, the the food insecurity is completely manufactured because we're tying it all to capitalism. And if instead you just clear your mind and just think, well, what does nature have to provide? Uh, it's a lot, and uh, so that's that's why you know I strongly feel that the wild, edible, medicinal, and fiber plants should be taught in school. I just feel so strongly about that. And we should have public service announcements telling people about all of this. Because there are many plants um, that provide antibiotics, um, you know, all kinds of medicinal uh, value as well. Um, And so it's very, very short-sighted, if not dangerous, that we're so dependent on commercial products when we've got all of this around us. So. And, and lots of these plants are what we consider weeds, which is crazy, right? Yes, it's, very, it's a very derogatory um, a word to call plants. It's, it's, 
you know, there is no such thing as, as weeds. Nature has given everything a purpose. And it's up to us to figure out what that purpose is. Nature doesn't seem to have accidents. If something appears to go wrong, there's a reason for it. So it's, and, and nowadays, a lot of people think, oh, well, you want to go back to eating the way the American Indians do. And I say, ooh, no, you know, we've got it much better than the American Indians ever had it because we've got all these um, other plants from other countries that are now here growing. And, uh, and once again, we've called them a derogatory term, invasive species, when in fact, um, you know, they're, they're, well, if you really want to get into it, you know, at one time, way back in geological history, uh, we were all one continent, and then we split up into several continents. So in fact, all these plants are, were related originally. So there is no such thing as really an invasive. Um, unfortunately, it was used as an excuse to spray pesticides and herbicides everywhere. And we're, you know, we're fighting that as well. Uh, however, um, these, the, the bounty that these plants have provided us from other countries is phenomenal. It's, it's far more exciting than what um, the American Indians had in the past. So let's get down to brass tacks. Let's talk about some of these plants. What, what I think we wanted to highlight, if we have time, highlight maybe five plants. Yes, we, uh, yes. Um, well, first I want to uh, start with the cautions. Um, you really do need to identify the plants you're going to be, you know, sampling initially. So, you know, it's, it's no and go slow, you know, no and slow. Those are the two words you have to keep in mind. Yeah, um, and, and so um, what I did when I was learning about this subject is, um, you know, I went on a, a tour, um, only one actually with Wildman Steve Brill from New York City. And um, he, he's known for foraging in, um, in Central Park. Um, but he travels all over the East Coast mainly to teach about uh, wild edible plants. And so, so that is, um, that's the, the most important thing is you need to know it. And there is so much information out on the internet, uh, wildfoodies.org. We have a reference uh, resource website with all kinds of information. So I, I would like to go through um, that um, as well. Let me just do a few more of the cautions. Just give me one second. I want to let everybody know that we are going to have links to Lynn's website and resources and images of the plants that we discuss at sustainabilitynow.global instead of .com. So, um, so the other, the other caution is when you do start to eat a plant, you want to go very slow. Uh, you don't want to just start gobbling it because everybody's got a different reaction to things. Some people are very allergic to dandelion leaves. So you, you want to go slow, um, take a little bite. Um, and, and if you're really not sure of, of if this um, plant is uh, safe or not, let's say you're on a deserted island and you have to eat something, you don't know what, then you, you end up taking the leaf and breaking it and putting it on a sensitive part of your body you know, under your armpit, that sort of thing, wait for a reaction, you know, on your tongue or lip, but you don't just start eating it right away. Um, so, uh, so that's the other thing. And also you want to avoid uh, contaminated areas. Now, having said that, like right next to a road, having said that, there is no such thing as a pristine environment in this country. And toxins have been spread on farm fields, have been spread in the woods, they could be anywhere. So if you want to really be careful, you know, you could have your soil tested. You could buy or, uh, organic soil and put it in pots, um, you know, to be sure that your um, soil is not contaminated. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Certainly in the city, if there's an abandoned lot, chances are it's going to be pretty contaminated. So you want to um, either um, bio or phyto remediate it. So there are plants that you can uh, plant, spread in an area that will help clean up uh, a site. Now that will take a few years. Um, anyway, so that gives you some sort of an idea uh, of where you might want to um, forage. When I look for a place to forage, I'm looking for weeds. Because if I see a lawn that's mainly grass, I figure there's been spraying going on. 
So you want to look at an, an area that there's a, a lot of diversification um, uh, present. Um, okay, so then the next thing is, you know, knowing it, you can go online uh, for those, uh, for that information. And some of the, um, I have my notes here. Uh, well, wait, let me just interrupt. I know that in terms of identification, one of the things that you discuss with me is that you can roll up a leaf and smell it. Right. And so yeah. can you talk about that a little. Yes. Okay. So, uh, and thank you for, for bringing that up because there's different, what you use all your senses to identify a plant, you know, sight, feel is really important because some plants uh, can be fuzzy or sticky, um, you know, and you don't know that until you touch them. And then, then the next thing is just take the plant of the leaf or the flower, um, sometimes the bark, but um, first with the leaf, you roll it and, and roll out the oils and smell it. And then, and that will tell you a lot. Um, other, other plants, it would be a twig. And then you do the scratch and sniff. So you scratch the bark away and then smell it. And that, that gives you a clue as to what the plant is. Spice bush is a, a good example of that. Um, and sassafras as well. Um, you can do the same thing with roots. Dig up a root, scratch and sniff. Um, and, and so you use your, your, your sight, your, your touch, your smell. Sometimes even your hearing. You just hear the way something rips if it's, uh, if it's brittle. It will tell you certain things. So um, those are the many ways. And then plants also, a lot of people think of wild um, edible foods as always being uh, bitter like dandelion leaves. And that's just not true. Mm -hmm. There's several uh, plants that are very bland like iceberg lettuce. Um, then other plants that are, that are bitter, but bitter uh, serves a purpose in your diet. Um, there's other plants like garlic mustard. I love the name garlic mustard because it tastes just like garlic and mustard, a combination of those. Um, the root tastes like horseradish. So that, that plant is, is very interesting. Um, then there are plants that uh, are very, you know, fruit is sweet. Some of it is astringent. Um, and then um, plantain um, that we will see, I have a picture of, that tastes like mushrooms. Um, it really does. I, I was astounded. astounded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you have a, a pineapple weed. That's the name of it, unfortunately. But it should be called pineapple chamomile. And it smells just like chamomile and pineapple. Uh, you know, so you can get just a huge array of, of tastes and smells um, or fragrances from these, from these plants. So it's not just a, you know, bitter greens and that's it. No. Right, right. Uh, and the one thing I really love is um, the, the black birch tree. Now, not any birch, but the black or otherwise known as sweet birch tree. Um, I love to show people that tree because they take off the, you know, a little branch and they scratch and they go, oh my word, that smells just like, yeah, birch beer or root beer, what we would call root beer. It smells just like that. And it just, people are so astonished uh, by all of that. Um, but, you said uh, you have some pictures? Well, I do it in just a second. I, I do want to, um, I, I do have some pictures. Let me, let's go to a few pictures. Um, now, these are not all in the order of the season. Uh, but uh, one of my favorites uh, are, is, um, is just the mulberry tree. And it's funny because mulberries grow like a weed. I hate to say, use that term, but they do. And yet most people in, in um, this, now I'm trying to put that up. Let me just do it like that. And we, we don't see that. So that's okay. Um, and a lot of people are going to be listening to this, not right. yet, but they'll be listening to it. So you guys that are listening, go check, it, check out the images for right. different plants at sustainabilitynow.global. Yeah, so so mulberry, mulberry, uh, the, the mulberry fruit is really probably the, the sweetest, most accessible uh, fruit in this area uh, and in a lot of areas. And it grows wild. It's native, the, the dark mulberry. The, the white mulberries are from Asia and they're pretty much cultivated anyway. They're not that they're not really a wild species. Um, but but that is a fruit that um, there's quite a few trees down by um, the Delaware River 
um, right off uh, Columbus Boulevard. This is in the Philadelphia area. In the Philadelphia so area. International audience, so. Okay, all right. Yeah. Well, we come to <laughs> in June. So, um, so that is, you know, that's sort of an example of a fruit that's plentiful, yet people aren't seeing it on the grocery store shelves. And these are trees, and maybe you can give a description of what the fruit looks like, because it's very unusual and beautiful. Well, no, you're thinking of paper mulberry. Oh, I am. That's yes, true. yes. This is just mulberry. This okay. is just the, the regular mulberry tree. That's, it, it, it's interesting you should mention that, because there's paper mulberry and there's mulberry. Okay. So the mulberry trees, they fruit out in June. Okay. Um, and the paper mulberries, they fruit out anywhere from August to October. And that's a, com that's a different kind of fruit. Okay. Uh, now, the paper mulberry is from Asia. And it's got a fruit that's uh, like a pom-pom, the size of a, a, of a ping-pong ball. And it has a soft seed center. But everything around it is bright orange-red. Um, and it looks, and like, it looks almost like it's prickly. Um, yes, right. It's beautiful. Right. It's in it. And it, it, uh, it looks like you turned an orange inside out. Yeah. The segments, the juicy segments are all on the outside. It's the most gorgeous fruit. Um, and it's, you know, again, this tree is growing everywhere. Um, there is a male and female situation. So only the females, um, produce the fruit. Um, and they're still fruiting now in, in Philadelphia. So that's exciting. And then, um, and then can you, can you describe the mulberry? So, um, paper mulberry, it's a tree. Yeah, paper mulberry is a tree. It's called paper mulberry because you can also, um, you know, make paper and fiber out of it. Um, the regular mulberry is, um, uh, is a tree as well. It's got smaller leaves. They're shiny. Um, you know, they, they, they were related um, it initially now, you know, with the taxonomy, uh, it's, it's, it's parted ways. So now they're saying they're not related. I think they still kind of are. So, you know what, let's, I, it's occurring to me that there were some things that you taught us on our foraging expedition about plants that are generally safe and plants that aren't. And that had to do with the edges of the leaves. And I, I'm wondering if you'd maybe talk about that a bit so that people can say generically, it's like, you see this, you just want to steer clear of that as well, a foundation. Well, I wouldn't take that too far. I, okay. I, I did say that um, when it comes to grape leaves, if you see a, if you see a bunch of grapes in a, 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 a smooth leaf, that's not edible. That's a poisonous grape. It's called moon seed. Um, and you don't want, you don't want to be fooling around with And that. when you're saying smooth leaf, you're talking about the edges being the edges. serrated or smooth. Right. They're not serrated right. uh, or jagged at all. Um, and, um, and, and there are some other examples of that. I think what I, I, I meant to, to say is that the, a lot of the fruit trees have serrated edges and, and, you know, when you see a serrated edge, that kind of gives a clue in, in terms of the fruiting. I just wouldn't take the smooth edge too far uh, along those lines. Um, but it's interesting because with, um, with the, uh, the carrot, the, um, the uh, Queen Anne's lace, the wild carrot, um, that has a very fuzzy stalk and it's got, um, um, and it's, it's, it's a fuzzy kind of plant at the, at the top. Now that tends to look like um, poison in a hemlock, but hemlock's very smooth. And so, so you can tell the difference between the two with a fuzzy stalk versus a smooth stalk. So, okay. so, you know, so you can, so the, I had just noticed some of the poisonous plants, there was a smoothness to them, you know, in different characteristics as compared to others. Um, so, so that gives you sort of a, a clue as to what's going on there. But, um, but I, I want to get back uh, for a moment to um, just, um, where you can find information. Really the, the, the um, main resource for a lot of foragers is Plants for a Future, pfaf.org. And um, they have, they're based in Britain, but they have a lot of plants listed. They do go by Latin and common names. So that's a, a huge resource. Uh, another good resource is um, eattheweeds.com, um, I think that is. 
um, and that's the Green Dean, eattheweeds.com. And he does a wonderful job of explaining all these plants. Um, uh, also gives the background and the history, which is so nice. Um, you know, provides the color. Um, and then Wikipedia, you know, I go there. Uh, they often have a lot of information as well. Now there are other websites that have good photos and they've got brief information, good photos. It's a quick access thing. And that would be, um, uh, that would be Foraging Texas, believe it or not. Now the Foraging Texas guy, he is, um, he's also the author of the um, Idiot's Guide. So can you see that? Yes, so this is the Idiot's Guide to Foraging. Right, it's a Wonderful. good beginner. It's a good beginner book. And okay. uh, this is just the, a copy of the, the front page because I somehow lost my, my copy of it. Um, so this is good. He has a website um, that's, that's very good called foragingtexas.com. Then there's the um, Northern Bushcraft is good, edible, uh, which is northernbushcraft.com, ediblewildfood.com, and eattheplanet.org. So those, those, plant, those uh, four websites are good for good photos because when you're first starting out trying to identify plants, it's really important to have good photos. And a lot of the books, like I started out with um, this book. This is Edible Wild Plants. And who wrote that? Uh, this is Elias and Dykeman. Okay. Now, this is your typical, you know, um, your typical uh, uh, guidebook. However, they're not enough pictures for the beginner. So that's why pictures are important. Um, and so that's, that, that, that's a good guide. And then um, Letta Meredith's Northeast Foraging is another popular one. Okay. And actually even, you know, uh, now this is, this, this is interesting because this is the complete guide to uh, edible wild plants by, guess who? The Department of the Army. Oh my, how about that? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Isn't it? That's wild. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I just want to remind everybody you're hearing this wonderful, amazing list of resources. Lynn, thank you so much for compiling these. Um, we're going to have them all listed on our website at sustainabilitynow.global. So you'll see that. You'll see the pictures there. This is amazing. So tell us more. Well, so then, um, so then the waterfordpress.com, um, Waterford Press. They do a lot of these guides. Let me just get it here. So we have edible survival plants of the Rocky Mountains, of the Eastern Woodlands, and uh, edible wild plants, as well as medicinal plants. Right. Awesome. So and actually that, I, let me just interrupt because you're giving us all these great resources. Are they talking about medicinal uses for these plants as well? Um, it, a lot of these, these um, it varies. Okay. It varies. But the thing right. is, if you want to put together your own guide, if you, you know, if, if, if you live in some other place, you can go to them and they'll custom make a guidebook for you. Wow. So, yeah. So that's, that's the interesting thing about Waterford is, um, um, waterfordpress.com is it, uh, and I've been thinking of doing this on my bucket list of things I need to do right. before I die. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, is to do something like this because the information isn't as complete as I would like to see it. Um, but they, it, it does show you that there is this interest out there. People want to give uh, people a uh, guide. Uh, this is great if you're camping and you go, you know, they have this at the, you know, at an office or something, you know, for the, for the park. Uh, wherever you want to go camping so that it gives you a guide it, 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 it makes you interested in what's going on in nature you know this is the thing i found with this whole field of interest is people are just so excited to learn about the nature around them yes it connects them with their yes. environment like nothing else does to sit there during a class and just learn about botany and the parts of the plant and, you know, and all of that and, and not know their uses is just to simply not connect the dots. Yeah. We need to connect the dots as a, as a civilization. We need to know what, how does this affect my daily life? You know, so. I agree. And I know that as we connect to nature, we can, have a greater appreciation for what we need to do to take care of our planet. 
Right. It, it sparks curiosity. All yes. of a sudden you start looking at a plant, you're like, well, what, what have you done for me today? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, one of the um, things that the kids love to, uh, and I don't have the picture of it, but uh, that people, one of the first uh, plants we teach often is wood sorrel. And uh, people initially think it's clover, but the, but the, little, um, the little leaflets are heart-shaped. So it okay. really looks like a shamrock. Okay. And, um, and it's a little yellow flower and it has um, a lemony tart taste. Mm. And I love to chew on that. So it's a nice throat tonic. Um, it does have some medicinal properties. I mean, I don't think you should eat a, a mountain of it, but it's good to just eat. It's like a trail nibble. Um, and so when people get that lemony taste, they go, oh my gosh, you know, where did that come from? And it's in most people's lawns. If they don't throw pesticides on them, you'll find wood sorrel everywhere. Very cool. That's right. awesome. And I, mm -hmm. I, I was so I just want you to talk about plantain too. But before before we do that, you were talking about resources, and I know there's some apps that are awesome for foraging as well. Yes. Right. Well, there are apps that that help out. Um, actually, I just got another. Um, um, and I can't remember the name of it. So these apps are going to be coming online all the time. Yeah. I tend to use Picture This. It's called Picture This. Um, and I also uh, also use Seek sometimes, S-E-E-K. That's part of iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I do use, it, it does help. You cannot rely on it 100%. And it's, it's really for plant identification. It doesn't really, at least um, picture this, doesn't really say that something is edible or not. Yeah, they, there are, um, I don't know if you can add information on. Some of those uh, apps, you can add information. I, I did it once. Uh, okay. I really got into it, like a, a Wikipedia kind of thing where you, well, used to be, that you could add information. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's just, it's a, blossoming field um, and it really helps I think the beginner out in terms of you think you know what it is it, it, it can uh, confirm your suspicions so yeah. it's an aid but you, you you know you can't completely rely on it yeah you want to use caution I'm such a you know I'm not a techie kind of person so I it took me a few years to um you know get into that technology and now i'm like oh this is so cool <laughs> <laughs> it is cool it is cool yeah. so let's just circle back to plantain because this was such a fascination to me mm -hmm. and it's everywhere right so here's a picture let's see if we can do this and so okay. that's plantain that is plantain those those are the stalks going up and this is broadly plantain Okay. It, it, it often grows in a group like that. So let's um, describe it for the folks that are listening. Right. So plantain is also called um, ribwort because it's got these strong um, uh, st uh, seams in the back, let's just put it that way, um, of the leaf. And so ribwort is very interesting. There's two kinds. There's the broad leaf, and, um, which is kind of tear duct shape or teardrop shape, sorry, tear duck, teardrop shape. And um, then there's the uh, narrow leaf plantain. And that is more spear shaped. It's more of a long, narrow leaf. Both of them have these ribs in the back. Um, and they grow everywhere. The broad leaf has a seed stalk that uh, grows about this high and then seeds all up and down the stalk, whereas the rib wart, um, the narrow leaf, that has the seeds just at the top. Um, but those are really cool to just cut off the, the, the narrow leaf, just cut off that seed pod and then just stir fry it. The seed pod. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You really? Can stir fry those. Yeah. Yeah. And, but, and the leaves taste like mushrooms. Yes. And so does, so do the seeds. Oh. Yeah. And you only pick them when they're green. You don't wait for them to get older and then you feel like you're tasting paper. Um, but at any rate, yes. Uh, now those are. Uh, would I eat a, a whole lot of them? I don't think so. It is a medicinal. It has medicinal qualities. So it, for internal and external 
uh, application. So what kind of qualities? Just so people know that there's all these, this wonderful medicine chest in nature. Not, we're not prescribing. We're not doing any of that. There's, you know, talk to your doctor before you go and right. try and use these things medicinally. But Right. So it, it's an antibiotic, antifungal. Um, so it, it, it really not only, and it's also a, a, a coagulant. So it helps stop bleeding. Um, so so that, you'd use it as a poultice? Yes, absolutely. So what people do is if they've been injured, um, a lot of people just uh, chew it, stick it in your mouth, chew it up, and then apply it, and then wrap, you know, wrap your wound um, and do it that way. Just do it as simply as that. Um, and it also helps the wound um, heal faster. And, you know, so it's, it's really an all around great thing to have. You can have some with you, you know, when you go on a, a hike or something, just put some in your pocket. Um, you know, I take it and it dries very beautifully and you just dry it and then, you know, crunch it up and put it in a, uh, put it in a jar for year round use. Um, and also you, again, you can use it on outside wounds, any kind of outside wound, burn, sting, anything. Hmm. Um, but you can also use it internally. Um, so, you know, I, personally found it helped with diverticulitis and hemorrhoids. Uh, but again, I would caution, it, it does have a drying agent. You know, it's a coagulant, it dries, it absorbs. So, um, you know, occasionally I use different herbs in my bath. And I notice with plantain, you know, it does dry. So, you know, it, it draws and dries. So you, you want to not overdo it. I would not overdo it. Um, and then, so that's a, that's a big one. It's everywhere. Um, and, and again, um, multiple, uh, uses, um, another, another, uh, common plant is the wild violet that a lot of people, you know, are aware of, and that's just your wild violet. And that comes out in the spring. Um, that, that leaf is very edible. It's, it's just bland, you know, it's mild. Um, and you can add that now, would you cook it or would you would you cook these things or eat them raw? Well, I would eat that raw, but you could cook it. Um, and going back to the plantain, there, if you're going to eat a leaf, it should be very young because if it gets older, it's going to be pretty tough to eat. So that's the way with a lot of plants. You know, you go for the young, the young leaves uh, rather than anything old and tough. Um, and so um, the wild violet... Um, now that, as opposed to the plantain, is a uh, blood thinner. So that has um, vitamin C. A lot of your, your greens have vitamin C. It has a lot of vitamin C, so it's very good. And again, we have to watch with this, just like um, if you eat a lot of, let's say you eat a lot of blueberries and almonds and other things that are blood thinners, you might get nosebleeds. Mm -hmm. um, same thing in the wild. If you start eating a lot of blood thinners and you don't um, balance it off with blood thickeners, um, then if you find you're getting a nosebleed, you need to balance off your diet. Um, and uh, so, uh, so with wild violets, I would have some, you know, the other thing, the good thing about the wild violet leaf is you can actually um, stick something in that and wrap it in there and eat it. So you eat it as a, you know, it's a wrap. It's How big a, are the leaves? Well, the leaves are, you know, it varies. It, they can be this big. So that's about they two, can be two this three big. inches. Yeah, it just depends on the, on the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the plants we see in, in, are, have been in the city, let's say, have been stepped on. They've been mowed. You know, they haven't had a chance to really develop. Mm -hmm. Plantain, when it's in, in the wild violet and other plants, when they're really in, um, you know, their element and allowed to flourish, they, they can be quite large. Hmm. So it just depends on the situation. You know, uh, what about, I know that you can eat hostas. Yes, hostas now, you know, hosta is kind of our exception to the rule. Generally speaking, we go with just wild plants. Um, hosta is a wild plant in, in Japan and Asian countries. Um, the kind of hostas we see here are almost all hybrids, uh, but they are all edible. Uh, everything but the root, I think. Um, so you've got the leaves that come out in the spring as a shoot, and it's all 
tightly wrapped. You can cut them off right then and there and eat them uh, raw. You, cook the, you can eat them raw. Or too? cook it. Or okay. cook it. Yeah, you can do both. So, um, and then when they send up the stalk and the flowers, that's all edible as well. Again, you know, you might like it better cooked than raw. You know, some people, again, uh, might have a back taste to it that they're not wild about. Um, you know, but the leaf to me is pretty, pretty safe. Now, a lot of people will eat daylilies. That's something else that came from Asia. Um, and, but a lot of us get a back taste to it that we're not that thrilled with. So you might want to cook that. You know, so there's there's choices you need to make with with some of these foods. I have to ask you about milkweed. Oh, because yeah. you know, milkweed. I I understand you can eat the pods and the and and also cattails. I wanted to find out about that. Well, yeah, you pick the two things. I don't have that much experience. Oh, that's okay. So pick something else. That's okay. Well, milkweed is is you know edible. And, um, and it's called milkweed because it has a lot of latex in it, natural latex. Um, so people do cook it up and it's, 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 it's uh, popular among uh, chefs to do milkweed pods and actually even the uh, uh, blossoms or the buds. Uh, when, do the, when do you harvest them? Do you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure. Maybe okay. around July. Not, okay. I'm not really sure about that. But a lot of people kind of avoid milkweed because of the monarch butterfly. Yeah. So they, you know, they, they'd rather uh, it be left to that, um, that. Now, when it comes to the cattail, that's interesting. Um, I had heard that the roots of the cattail were very uh, good. So one day, you know, we saw some cattails growing near the road. <laughs> I just went out and I said, I'm going to get myself one. And I, so I just broke one off and, and took it home and cut off the bottom, you know, maybe about that much. And it was delicious. It was, um, it's, it's a starch and uh, it was very good. And, and this was the stalk. On, so cat the stalk, the bottom cat of the stalk. Okay. But, but also the roots are uh, also have starch in them. So okay. cattails and reed grass or phragmite, uh, both have a lot of starch in those roots. And the reason they're not used more for foraging, you know, for eating is because in their natural environments, they are the water is basically contaminated so they're remediating the water yes they are helping to clean the water but you want to eat the roots i only did it because i wanted to check the taste you know gotcha but you would really need to have a situation where you know that that water's clean before you really get into eating a lot of those those roots sure uh, but i think it's an untapped resource to be honest yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, those things, again, grow very fast and uh, robustly. And, you know, that's, that's the interesting thing between wild food enthusiasts and people who are more, you know, your garden club variety person, is that they want a plant that's going to fit into the landscape like a vase in their front room, that it's not going to spread. It's just going to sit there looking pretty. But realistically, if you think about it in terms of common sense, if you want food to eat, you want plants that spread, you know, and, and so there comes that funny thing where people will say, oh yeah, well, it's edible, but you know, it spreads everywhere. Well, you kind yeah. of want that. You kind of want that. Gotcha. So maybe um, what, what people have to learn to do more is have spreading plants next to each other and they can just fight it out for space. I love uh, it. But anyway, so, so uh, I'm just keeping an eye on time for us. And um, in the last few minutes of our time together, I'm wondering if what you'd like to squeeze in there under the wire. Well, um, again, let's just talk about a few other plants. Um, mugwort. Mugwort's a very interesting plant. It kind of looks like that. Well, we're going to have a picture on the website at sustainabilitynow.global. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and it's a very interesting plant because um, it's also called sage wort because it smells like sage. It's an herb. I've got it in a container in my back alley. I don't have a yard in an alley. And, um, and it, I, I, it's an anti-parasite type medicine. So it helps. It's, its other name is wormwood. 
So it helps to expel parasites. Um, and it also gives things a nice taste. So if you're making turkey or chicken in particular, like a poultry, it's nice to put a little pinch in there. Um, in the morning, what I tend to do is I like to take a little bit of that, a little bit of plantain, a little bit of wild violet, um, maybe a little bit of mint. Um, I've got shiso mint growing in the uh, in my back alley as well. It's very robust and um, uh, adaptable. Um, and then I just put those in a blender with water and then sieve out the greens and, and put it in a pitcher and make sure it's just light green. And then I sip on that and I use it in my cooking and all that so that, um, so that you get this extra uh, vitamins and minerals uh, in, your, in your diet uh, that a lot of us are missing. So it's one way to, to use uh, plants on an everyday uh, basis. I so I would it. just say, you know, jump into the pool, you know, walk in the woods, learn about these wild edible plants and um you know uh it, it it really gives you a wonderful sense of adventure exploration and uh fulfillment it is really really rewarding i i've been on a few of your foraging expeditions it's been a privilege and a pleasure to do that and i encourage everybody listening to look for people in your area that are doing that meet up in the U.S. has been a really good resource for that. And um, just check out all these resources that we've posted and see, see uh, what you can do with it and connect with nature. Thank you. Lynn, thank you so much for being with us. This was great. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for doing it and having me. It was a, a lot of fun. Great. So <laughs> I just want to say thank you to you, our listeners, for being here, for supporting us. Please share this widely. We want people to know that nature has so much bounty for everybody. And I want to thank our producer, Scott Billy. And that's it for today. So um, I'm your host, Mira Rubin. Until next time, live your best life, love the world around you, and together we can save the world. Thank you for listening to Sustainability Now solutions to shape a world that works. Visit sustainabilitynow.global for resources related to today's program. And be sure to subscribe, share, and follow us on social media.